Hey, good morning. <coughs> sorry for the sorry for the delay. We had some technical issues with this, so all right. So um, so today we're talking about the question the question of representation and how it is uh, discussed in criticism, literary criticism, because it's part of what we do in criticism. And the questions that come with it are the following. The what, what is the relationship between texts and the world? How do texts represent the world? Where does a text begin and end? Is an author an inhabitant of the world or the creation of a literary text? To what extent is history a kind of text? And what, and what implications does this have for thinking about literature? And can literary texts do things to the world as well as simply describe it? Okay? So these are questions that are related to representation. And representation is something we do every day. This is something that is very common. We represent all the time. When you talk, when you, when you talk about yourself, when you talk about others, when you tell stories, when you talk about the news, they all come in form of representation, you know, because representation, you know, the word is, is made up of two things. You have the, the prefix re, which is again, and presentation, which is to present things, right? To present things, in other words, th make things present again, you know, the, which means that when you represent, you're actually bringing to the present that which is absent. We always represent in, absten in, in absentia, in other words, in absence. It's about the absence. That which is not here is the one we bring. And we do that most of the time through language. It is language that allows us to bring things into the presence or to the present. Because we, as human beings, we are we're like programmed, I think, let's say, to think <coughs> of uh, meaning or to seek meaning in presence or, the, or to seek the presence of meaning which relates it to present time, to the present tense if you want, to, to now, right? It only has sense if it's there. It's both it's present in front of us, because the question of presence being there, but at the same time being present in this moment now, right? And so if something is absent, we bring it back. Right? We like, bring it through words, through language, to the present time. And so that's a little bit complicated, right? Because when we do that, are we really representing? I mean, because we think of representing as describing most of the time. It's description, but is it, is it really description? No. Right? Do we really describe the world, describe things, right? An event, news, uh, something that happened, your childhood, your dreams, whatever. If you had a dream, you want to talk about it, you bring it to us in language when in your head, when you were sleeping and you were dreaming, it's not really in, in words, right? It's, it's not in words, it's, it's images. It's like a film, it's like a video that, you, that your subconscious uh, produces for you, for your entertainment while you're sleeping. <laughs> so you have to bring it into words. In, anyway, so it, it, this also asks, the question or brings, back, brings up the question of, uh, of the relationship between words and worlds or words and things, right? Something we talked about earlier, I mean, not earlier in the, in the course, when we said, when we I mentioned uh, this concept of the sign, right? Because signs, that's what we have, signs. Words are signs. There's sound images, but they're signs. Uh, clothes are signs, everything is a sign. Um, everything here is a sign. We live in signs, like, and we call them sign systems, right? because they are connected in ways so that they can make sense. That's why it's called a sign system. And the example of a sign system is the traffic signals, the system of traffic signals. They're related, they're, they are related, and they, are all, and they all have to do with how to behave when you're driving a car on the roads. Right? It's a sign system. It's a whole system of signs that you have to know to, to be able to drive safely and especially not to get caught.
caught by the police and pay a fine, <laughs> right? Okay, so these are called science systems, but language also is a science system, right? Um, fashion is a science system or science systems? We talk about fashion and science systems. There's so many things that are called science systems, okay? But the fundamental thing is the sign itself. When we talk about the sign, we talk about something that gives a meaning, that has a meaning, that relates to something, that refers to something that is not there most of the time. The word tree refers to something that is not here. We don't have a tree, we have them outside. But we don't even know which tree we're referring to because it's just a tree, right? So the relationship, as you know, as you may have learned in your classes in linguistics, is that the relationship between the six, the the signifier and the signified, these, these are the words we use for, right? The signified is that which is not here, that which we represent, and the signifier is the thing we use to represent it. The word tree is a signifier of something that is not here, the tree, right? And so the relationship, as you know, we know about uh, 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 from linguistics, from especially from the Ferdinand de Saussure, is that this relationship, he calls it arbitrary in the sense that it's not just like stuck there, but it's, it's because there is no relation, no physical or material relationship between the word tree and the object that we refer to as tree. So it's, it's arbitrary in that sense, right? Um, okay, and so the, those words that, are, um, th that represent things uh, are th our only way of not only bringing things to the present, to present them, but also it's our only way of understanding things as well, of having access to the world. It's language that allows us to have access to the world. We can only access it through language. Understanding the world comes to us through language. Politics, to understand the government, it's language, right? To understand uh, society, you need a language for society. Culture. Lots of science systems and, and language is important in it too, etc. So we have these things that we do. And so the representation is always present because there is that thing that we have these instruments and we think of them as instruments of representation. When you think about that, you say, this is, it's like a tool. It's like a set of tools that we use to represent. But uh, in criticism, when we're thinking about it this way, we start to think that it's not just tools. It's not just tools to represent something. But actually, it's tools to make things, too. Because they have an influence on how we perceive things. And so they can present, they can give us, they can create worlds, right? If you bring, uh, if you bring up a story from the past, you are making a story. Even though you, you, you know, honestly, you think that you are just telling us something that you remember happened, but it's already gone. That thing doesn't even exist anymore. And so by telling, it as, by telling us this again, it's like you are creating it or recreating it. Yeah, okay? Okay, I'll give you an example of a, of a song. I don't know how many of you know Bob Dylan. Do you know the singer, the poet, Bob Dylan? Bob Dylan was a... Uh, not this. Let me see if I can... Uh, I don't know how many of you know the song. It's called "Man." Man gave names to to, the, to all the animals. It, it's a little funny. It's a it's a funny song, but it's interesting because it, it makes you think. Man gave names to all the animals in the beginning. In the beginning, man gave names on a long time ago, and then he goes from like one. That that part, the four lines, the 
that uh, thing that comes over and over is what I put in between brackets there, so I don't have to repeat it. Anyway, so the first one is that he saw an animal that liked to growl, big furry paws, and he liked to howl, great big furry back and, and, and furry hair. Oh, I think I'll call it a bear, <laughs> right? Yeah. right? So and then the next one, he saw an animal up on a hill showing up so much grass until it was filled, he saw milk coming out, but he didn't know how. Oh, I think I'll call it a cow, <laughs> right? And then he goes like that again with this one. Um, he saw an animal that liked to snort, holes on his head, and they weren't too short. It looked like there wasn't nothing that he couldn't pull. Oh, I think I'll call it a bull. And he saw an animal named Muddy Trail, a real dirty face and a curly tail. He wasn't too small and he wasn't too big. I think I'll call it a pig. And then we have this other one that the next step, uh, animal that he meets had a wolf on his back and hooves on his feet, eating grass on a mountainside so steep, I think I'll call it a sheep. And then he saw an animal smooth as glass, slithering his way through the grass. He saw it disappear by a tree near a lake, I think I'll call it a snake. Okay, so it's just, you know, but when, you, when you look at these things, it's the, the descript. You would think, well, human beings looked at things, saw how they looked, and called them, and gave them names based on how they appear, on their appearance, right? But the, when the appearance, for example, uh, uh, the cow, for example, or the bull, that doesn't, you know, the, the, there is absolutely no connection between the name bull and the appearance of the bull, right? So the, this is what I call, you know, when I said the veterinariness of things. So it's not a description that gives us the name, but it's something else. I mean, in, in linguistics, and we know this, it's convention. Right? It's what people actually believe, you know, like agreed. It's an agreement, it's a general agreement to call this thing this and to call this thing that. Right? So it's, there is a general agreement. And so that general agreement is just happened. It happened by chance or it happened. We don't know how it happened exactly. But when you look at that and then you say, well, this is interesting because then uh, who, how did people agree to that? And who are the first people to agree to that, and how did that get generalized? I mean, we did not really agree to anything. Did you agree to call uh, something? No, you didn't. But you were born into it, and it was there before you, and it was there before your parents, and before your parents, etc. So it's a long time it's been there. But we do create some stuff, right? We do create words, right? Because today, lots of words that get created today, for example, with young people, especially, they're always creating new words new expressions, new ways of understanding things, or different meanings, newer meanings for, for words that already exist, okay? Anyway, so it doesn't mean that we are absolutely powerless. We still do things and continue bringing things in there. Anyway, this is an example I wanted to show you of that kind of, uh, of how this question of um, arbitrariness works. Um, uh, Of, this, of the question of arbitrariness works, how it works. Okay. Anyway, so um, okay. Those of you who are a little bit familiar with Plato, with the philosopher Plato, mm -hmm. and his his book, his big book, is called the the it's called the the Republic. Uh, the Republic is what it was called by, in English and in French, because the, the, in, in the Greek word is not Republic. It's, that's not exactly what it means. It's called politeia. That's the original word, politeia, um, which is a little bit like citizenship uh, and, and participation in a state and being in a state. Right. It's a little complicated word, but it, it doesn't mean Republic. Uh, directly. The Republic is actually just one part of the whole book. But anyway, what matters is that Plato uh, banished poets from his Republic. He said poets have no place in the Republic. Philosophers have a place, they are the rulers, but poets have no place in there. And, and, and that's because he says they are creating things, because they, poets um, corrupt people's... Hmm? They play with the words that they don't really... Yeah. The reality. 
because the reality is not known, he said. They only know the imitation of the reality. What we see is only not the real things what we see, but what we see is, an, uh, is, a, is a copy of the real world, right? Because you remember the, 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 the vision he gives, or the, if you want, the, the metaphor he uses is the cave, people sitting in a cave with their backs to the entrance. They don't even know that there is an entrance to the cave. They're inside the cave. And the light comes from outside, right? And then it projects everything that's outside on the wall, right? Of the, of the cave. It's like a cinema, basically. You're sitting in, a, in the cinema and you see the light, the projector lights going from behind you and projecting things in there. Except that you don't know that there is a projector and that you can't turn your head because you're chained. They're chained. He says that these people are changed, changed, changed. sorry, chained. <laughs> they, uh, in other words, they're, they're, they're like stuck and they can't move. Why? I don't know, because, but that's a metaphor if you want. And so that they can only see that and think that that's the real thing. Yeah. For them, that's the real thing. This is, this is how humans are, he says. Only the philo philosophers know that there is a world outside and, and they know the reality of the world. But most people, the general public, doesn't know. And so when the poets speak to people about things, they are saying they're talking only about about things that they see, which are just imitations of what is the reality of things, right? For example, if they're thinking about love, they don't know what real love means. Mm -hmm. Because what we have in the world is not real love, we have only an imitation of real love. Mm -hmm. It's a copy, it's a second hand, if you want. Mm -hmm. The real one is a metaphysical, the one that doesn't exist here, the one that he knows, that he understands. It doesn't mean that there is a cow outside, but it's not real. No, it is real. If you go in front of it, it will hit you. <laughs> it does exist. But that's not what he meant. It's not things, not objects. He was talking more about concepts, about understanding the world, the meaning of relationship, the meaning of power, the meaning of what's truth, etc., etc. So the, the, po the poets, he says, don't know. Only the philosophers know. And so when they talk about love, for example, they're just giving people illusions, not the real meaning of love. Anyway, so be because he, for him, they don't represent. And to represent means to corrupt things, to distort them, right? Because you don't, for Plato, and this is the metaphysical view, you cannot represent that which you don't know for real, right? You can only represent an imitation of something. And so that imitation of things is just as corrupt as the imitation itself. It's even more probably corrupt than the thing. Hmm? Exactly, it's like you know, you're just repeating this process of uh, imitation, of imitation, of imitation, which makes sense. I mean, this is, an, this is a problematic and view, of course, and, and we don't have to agree with it, etc. But anyway, <clears throat> the idea is that there is a difference between the world. When I say the world, it, it just, it's not objects or things, remember? We're talking about more like, um, my questions of relationships of humans, of understanding things, understand meanings of, uh, of human presence on this earth, you know, understanding the, uh, the, the nature of power, the nature of government, the nature of society, the nature of all these things. That's the concept. So basically, it's the concept, it's ideas, right? The world as, as ideas. Different yeah. Yeah, the complexity of the world and the, compl the complexity of the, of the concepts that represent, that are supposed to give us the truth about the world. Right? The concept is about giving us, in a nutshell, in a really concentrated, as, uh, giving us a, a, a concentrated meaning of a, of a, of a, of a phenomenon. Right? In a phenomenon is, is conceptualized in a, cert is, in a certain way for us to, to be able to talk about it. There, there, for example, love can be a concept, right? Hmm? Because it's something that, it's a word, a word concept that we use to describe something, a feeling, a, 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 situ a something, right? What connects people, right? What makes you close to one person to another, it could, it could be your father or mother or sister, brother, or another person, right? That thing that connects you. And we put that word on it, it's love, and we put the heart or something. Mm -hmm. All those things are, you know, to, 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 to make it possible for us to represent it. Because we need to represent that stuff, right? It's something that's there, but we need to represent it. Okay, and so for Plato, there is, um, we're not able, we can't do that. 
he says, only philosophers can do that. But in criticism, we, there is this belief that there is a difference between the world, as we know, between the love, the, 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 the thing, <laughs> I don't even know what to call it, <laughs> this thing, this relationship, this whatever it is, this feelings, this complex emotion, right, that we have, and the way we talk about it, right? Some people can talk about it beautifully, some others can't talk about it at all, they have no idea what to say. They say, what is love? They say, I don't know, right? And then you ask a, a romantic poet and they will give you, Ooh, wow, a lot of words. So much, you know, so many des descriptions and, and whatever, expressions of it until you say, okay, that's enough, okay? So there is this, this distinction between the world, as we see it, with the world as a, as a, as a, as a, as a manifestation, as a, as a phenomenon, and the world as representation. Okay, <clears throat> so we have this, these, these questions that guide us in, in our thinking, in our reflection on representation. There is a basic assumption, and, and I've been basically talking about that, the basic assumption to our ways of thinking about literature, for example, as uh, the, the separation of the literary work from the world, right? There is a separate, we think of it as separate, right? That is not this, right? Uh, so this, the world, we have on one side text and the world, and we think, of course, the text is not the world, right? The text cannot be the world. I mean, it's, it's common sense. Say, so this is common sense. There is this dichotomy between the world and the text. The text is something about the world, not the world in itself. But in criticism, they've been working, and critics and theorists have been working to dismantle this dichotomy. Say, okay, well, they have to break this because we, we think it's not, but it is actually what it is. It's, it, it, it's problematic. So they have to. The post structuralists, for example, worked on that a lot, right? And, and what they were trying is that they, their theories um, have been used in different, uh, different schools of theory, in schools of criticism, like New New historicism, the construction, certain forms, etc., gender studies, post-colonialism, etc. And their goal was consistently been to undermine the very terms of this text world dichotomy. Let's take that and then break it down to see how it, it doesn't how it doesn't work. How it works and doesn't work at the same time. Which is very post structuralist too. You know, always the couple <laughs> you say one thing and it's opposite in the same time. How it works, how it doesn't work. Right? How the representation works, but actually doesn't work too or doesn't work anymore, you know, whatever, it's something like that. So, questions, for example, that are basic, uh, do literary texts speak about the world, describe it, imitate it, etc., or do they in reality make it? This, this is something I've already said, so I went ahead of my slides. Instead of thinking of text on the one side and the world on the other, we might reflect on the idea that everything human that happens in the world is mediated by language, right? We've already said that. I've already spoken about how language is our access. It's, only, it's the entry to the world is through language, right? Or through language being the, 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 the biggest, right? the, the major. There are others, but language is the one. It's what makes us, basically, as humans, because only humans speak. Animals don't. They have other ways of communication, but not that. But it's language, again, when you say communication, it's not very accurate either to say language is communication, because it's not just communication. Communication is based on, usually we say communication is a message delivered from a messenger, from send, from someone who sends it to a receiver, right, through a medium. But that's very technical, right? That's very technical, and that concentrates only on the message. Whereas language is not just that, right? It's, it's not just communication. And so we also can make the same mistake while talking about animals, saying that animals only communicate through sounds and through things, etc. And it's not just communication either, right? It's, it's relationships too, because animals have feelings, they have emotions, uh, so it's just like the human beings too, except that they're different because it's a different science system. Right, okay. So uh, 
There is this, this you all can always hear, uh, hear all the time, but in the Apad of text, this is a phrase that comes from Derrida. Jacques Derrida is a great philosopher, is a deconstructivist, I call is the inventor or the creator of the school of deconstruction. Deconstruction means things are constructed, then you have to deconstruct them. It's the opposite of construction. In other words, like putting things apart, <laughs> taking every concept and putting it apart, right? It's, it's basically uh, very, it, it, it goes against the concept, the, the, the ordinary concepts of philosophy, which is like creation of meaning, creation of concepts. He's, he's actually asking those questions that undermine and, and also unsettle and even sometimes bother philosophers themselves by, by going over those, oh, really? Do you think, so? well, how about this, etc. It's like taking it the other side, yeah, taking the opposite direction, right? Say so it's a construction, you have constructed this, right? Like a concept has been constructed by practice, by common agreement, by lots of things between people who think about it. And then he would take the other side and say, well, no, it only applies to you <laughs> as a group because you, you kind of form some kind of category. But if you look at it from a different category, it doesn't really work. So you have to see it differently. That's why, for example, <clears throat> Derrida was interested in the margins of things, not in the centers. Right? And for example, he would be interested in writers who have always been like pariahs, those that people did not like. That people say, ah, that's not a good writer. That's, that's like a, an art, uh, let's say, uh, an outcast, uh, the, a person who uh, uh, cannot fit, right? Uh, in, in, in the norms of society. Those, and so he would go and, 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 and put those against the mainstream thinking to bring those contradictions and say these contradictions are more meaningful than actually just removing all the, you know, all the, all the things that don't agree with you and keeping only one, 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 one mainstream think, way of thinking. You know, it's like, it's like opposition, for example in politics or in society, okay? Anyway, th that's, that's very, that's a little farther from the point. We'll come back to it in, at different points in this lecture. His point is not that there is no such a thing as a real world, he says, in the part of text, in other words, when he says that, is that there is textuality and language in everywhere, in everything and everywhere. And so when he says this, it doesn't mean that there is no, no access to the real world except through language, right? Only language gives us that. So, Whatever thing you want to think about, the only way to think about it is through language, or to talk about it, or to access it is through language. That's why he says there is nothing outside of the text. Right? The, te the text means language. No, nothing outside language, if you want. Right? Everything comes to us through language. Whatever thing you want to talk about is through language. Yes? Do you actually agree with this taking the interpretation of Nothing outside the text? Yes. Right. Me? I kind of do, yes. Yeah. Because when you think about it, what is it that that's, can, can be outside of language? Yeah. I mean, even if you imagine it and keep it to your head, it, it, it stays there. But if you want to get it out, if you want to yeah. talk about it, you want to write it, you still have to use language. Right? So, I don't know. Is there anything outside of language? I find it's hard to generalize it. I mean, I would say there's no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's no, but I would say most of it's through language. Is there something? Can you think of something that's outside language? Yes. Um, I don't know. Tell me. You can tell me. Maybe I'm wrong. It's always, I don't like to generalize everything. I know, but it's not about generalizing. This is not a generalization. This is not a generalization. This is a very strong statement. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it about like try uh, translating feelings into words, like bonding with? What is? Because it's well, hypothetically mm -hmm. say that there is someone who who has never taught any language. Is that? Say that they know the real world. Yeah. For example, someone who doesn't speak like who, who never taught any language. There were some experiments, right? Yeah. About you know using trying to see people who never spoke any language. Yeah. How would they behave? Well, exactly. How would they behave? I think we don't know. It's very complicated. Yeah. But then, are there such concepts? Is, is it possible to, to think, for example... 
wait, wait. There is something, there is a difference between, for example, happiness. Let's think happiness, right? Uh, I think that animals can be happy. Dogs are happy, certainly. We have a dog, you know, when he's happy or he's not. Sadness, happiness, etc. But then, if you look at that and say, okay, can he tell me that he's happy? Yeah, but he can, he can show it. He can express it in a certain way, like by behavior, jumping up and down, being excited, etc., etc. But can he talk? The humans are the only ones who can put a word on that and say, this is called happiness. <laughs> this emotional, this state that I'm in is called happiness. And then they will try to define it, they will try to see the conditions for it, they would say, you know, and, and we got into some... Uh, in other words, we are creating a concept for something that is common, but the only way we can talk about it is if we can actually think about it and put words, and we may not even agree on it. Right? Like for say, uh, like money doesn't bring happiness or something like that. Uh, some people say, if I have a lot of money, I'd be happy. But then some other person say, well, that's not, that's not, mm -mm. You, may not you may not be happy even if you have a lot of money. Right? And so over there, we have a discussion, right? We have a, we have a disagreement on what makes happiness possible and what, uh, and what does not. Right? And so we get into discussions and get into different ways of thinking about this. What is it that makes people happy? And then you will have a million reasons why. But we are moved away from the, we're moving away from the feeling itself to a discussion about a concept and then we create a whole philosophy about that. And so we are creating something. And then another person who doesn't even, never spoke any language is just happy out there. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't, he doesn't care about your, you know, be, you having to write an essay about happiness. <laughs> Why don't you just be happy instead of talking about it? Be happy, but you don't have to talk about it. Anyway, so that, you see the complication. That's what he meant. Yeah. 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 So that's why it's the only way of talking about it or trying to discuss it is through language. Otherwise, it will not be possible. I mean, you can do abstract art. <laughs> and, and do something and say, <laughs> and then you call it, this is happiness. This is my expression of happiness. What? Well, yeah, why not? But that's, you're using a sign. You're using some signs, colors, shapes, patterns, uh, whatever they are. And you're putting that on a, on, a, on a canvas with a frame and hanging it on a wall and, or, or putting it on your phone and send it through Instagram and call it happiness. It's still something that is outside. It's not language, of course, but it's a sign. Right? It's a sign. And the sign and language is also a sign. So we're just using a different type of sign to talk about something else. To talk about something that, you, that goes beyond language. Right? And that doesn't happen in language. The funny thing is that people who are not happy speak about happiness too. <laughs> that people who are never happy in their lives can speak about happiness. Yeah. Which is ironic, right? Yeah. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, a person who is like a, a depressed person, you know, you people who have chronic depression, chronic depression, and talk about happiness, for example, they will talk about it in their own way. Even they don't know, I mean, they have never experienced it, or maybe they experienced it uh, not like you. And, we all experienced happiness at some point, so even those people will talk about something that is missing. Yeah. Poor people will talk about money, rich people will talk about other kind of problems. Right. We always yeah. see the things that we're missing. Right. And so we have the, we have to use something, we have to use language. Yeah. And, and we're not just using language, like I said about love, for example, we're not just using language to describe something that we, the, 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 to make this point clearer, you know, the fact that we can't talk about, about something in the same way, and we can't say the same thing, for example, if I give you an essay, I write about happiness, you will give me, I don't know, like 50 essays. 50 different versions of what happiness means, right? Which, and then, but you're all talking about something that we have felt, that you have felt. And, and it's the same. We have felt it in the same way. I mean, happiness is the same. The way we feel it is the same for everyone. What makes it happy, that's different. But the feeling itself is the same. But then when you want to write about it, it's going to be different. Right? So, the only way for us to be able to, un to see language, to, 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 you know, to, to understand it, or to talk about it at least, is to use language. 
And when you're losing, using language, we are creating each of us a version, a different opinion, a different view of the same thing that we experience in the same way most of the time. Yeah. Do you understand? Yes. Okay, this is how language is central to everything. Professor? Yes. So, like using your example, here we can say the language definitely doesn't describe, but it creates meaning because each one of us will create the meaning of having the exactly. to his perception, yeah. but it will never describe. So, the language is not objectively at No, it's not. No. Yeah. It's not the instrument that's subjective that you just want to use to describe something that's there. It's not like, it's not like a picture. It's not like a picture of something, right? A picture, even a picture sometimes is problematic because uh, does a picture represent you? For example, when you take a picture for your ID, you say, oh, this is your end. I mean, take it and then a few years later, it's not even the same anymore. I mean, you've grown, things have changed in you, etc., and you don't look the same anymore. So you have changed already. And the picture, by the way, even if it's instantaneous, even if they take the same moment, it's, it's, it's two-dimensional, right? It's two-dimensional, it's a picture. But you are three-dimensional or even more dimensional than that, right? So it, it's not the same. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, language does not mean ver verbal. It's not just words that we speak, verbal. Uh, but may include everything that works in the science system. This is, I'm just, these are the slides that uh, describe what I've said before. <laughs> I forgot to push the slides earlier. Even without words, for example, body language is an affair of language. There is the language of eyes, gestures, postures, movements, etc. There is the last of it. When you speak about language, it doesn't have to be only words. It's not just verbal, but you know, anything, like gestures. Uh, verbal language is given as a, as a science system uh, in relation to other science systems, and always as one articulated by a speaking subject located in society with language more accurately conceived of as language in use rather than, as, than a fixed rather than a fixed structure or system. In other words, the language in use, it looks simple. Earlier I talked to you about how we create different meanings for the same words. Yes. Right? Young people today, you know, they have different ways of talking about things using the same, using the, the, the usual words we know, but they mean completely different things. Yeah. They have, they give them other dimensions, they give them other, other layers of meaning. So they, you know, they make the dictionary bigger, like a diction, an entry for the word, I don't know what. Uh, a knife, for example, <laughs> I just talk about that. When you look at how people say the words knife, and, and the words that you use with it, the, you know, like say synonyms, but synonyms like are strange, but for example, they refer to it in different ways, right? I don't know, I'm just using that as a stupid example. But anyway, it could be anything, right? And so we was like extending the page of the, of the dictionary, adding more to it. It's like Wikipedia, you know? Yeah, Wikipedia is interesting because it works this way. Right? Uh, you take an article in Wikipedia, and any entry in Wikipedia, you can read it, and you find that there is something missing, you can actually create an account and send a suggest to them, now because it has to be approved. You can suggest to them other things, and they say, well, you have left out this and this and this and this, and you give proof, and you give like references and stuff, and they will upload it for you there. Yeah. Right? But only, in the past it used to be a little different. You can just add anything you want. Now it's different. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you can add, you know, the yeah. more you add to it, the more it, it becomes bigger, right? And, and more important, and actually, it, it, it replaces the, even translators become obsolete, becomes completely redundant, right? If you, if you want to, to have a job, for example, as a translator, uh, you're just wasting your time. Because Google can do translation now better than you, <laughs> right? Google is, is incredibly good at translation today. So the job of translators, Go on. Maybe you will be a proofreader if you want, or you can do uh, you know correcting a few things like. But it's interesting. anyway, if that there is there are, you know algorithms for that too, right? Okay, so um, I don't know where is my slide about my missus. Um, let me see. Okay, before I go into this course. Um, Okay, let's...
Anyway, so uh, the, the verbal language has in as a science system in relation to other science systems, uh, and always um, as one articulated by a speaking subject. In other words, there is there is always an agent uh, who speak. There is a speaking subject because when because when representation moves from because. Yeah, let me, let me get things in order. When I talked about representation in the usual and the conventional meaning of representation is that it's like a copy of something else, right? This is how we usually understand it because this is how we work. We, we, to make it easier for us as, as, as ordinary people, uh, we don't want to get into a discussion of whether that's the face value represents or not. You, you know, you tell me a story, you, you, know, you go, you say, well, I'm sorry, I missed the bus this morning or the bus came late, or I don't know, an accident happened on the road, and I'm supposed to, you know, just accept it. Say, okay, well, that's fine, it's the truth. It's what happened, right? So I'm not getting into the discussion with you, how, you know, about all the complicated things. Are we, are you sure? <laughs> right? We're not getting into that discussion. And so, as, as ordinary people, we, we seek, you know, we're pragmatic, we want to know things, right? We, so we have a story about something, and say, all right, that's what happened, okay? But if it hurts you, then you say, no, 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 wait a minute, maybe it did not happen this way. Okay. And so representation cannot always be just a copy of things. It's not based on, there is a word that we use, it's an old word, it's called mimesis. I don't know if you... Yes. Yes. Mimesis. Mimicking the reality. Yes. In, the, in the word mimesis, you have mimic, to mimic is to copy, it was to mark or to something. But mimesis is very strange because it's a, it's a complex word because it's both copying and mocking. You, we saw that with the poem. The, you remember the poem, the Ozymandias? We say, the hands that mocked, which meant imitated, described or showed or painted by words. But at the same time, that can be also, that, that ridiculed, right? Something that distorted it, mimics in the sense of not being faithful to what you saw. Because caricature, for example, is also based on mimesis, except that it's, it uses this other form of mimesis, which is to copy with mockery, right? Whereas realism is supposed to be the real thing, right? There is a movement of realism, expressive, we can call it express, expressive realism. In other words, that everything expresses a reality, expresses a meaning as we know it, as we know. For example, stories, uh, you read a biography of an author or you read a story, etc. And the assumption is that you are reading the truth about someone, the truth about their life, how they lived, what they lived, what they experienced, how they behaved with other relationships, etc., and what happened to them, right? And so, uh, in that sense, mimesis is like holding the what we call hold the mirror to nature. This is Shakespeare. He calls art or literature holds the mirror up. He was talking about the theater. Holds the mirror up to nature. In other words, it holds the mirror to the world, and so the world can be reflected in art, in, in theater, because that's what theater is about. We talk about the representation of performance. In French, we say a représentation for a play, for a play right? In English, we say a performance. It's different. Yeah. Representing is not performing. Performing is you're doing something, you're creating something, because to perform is to act, to change, to do things, to... To make. Yes, it's like to create and make something, whereas to représente, Représenter in French would be just like showing a picture or showing something that happened. That you're not bringing anything from you in it. You're being objective. So there is this assumptions about representation being objective, etc. And so um, when I was talking about mimesis, is that uh, mimesis uh, is this common vision of things. This common vision of representation as being that which represents more or less faithfully or faithfully to a larger extent and we give the, the credit of truth to whoever represents, right? We give them the credit and say, okay, well, you know, we go with the assumption that they're telling the truth, a novel, a story, etc. that there's something that's true or a, a newspaper story, like a, something that happened, you know, events, etc. that happened and you read about them. Uh, in the newspaper or on the internet, and, and you say, well, this is what happened, this is what somebody said, etc. And we give them the credit of truth, because it's all based on that idea of mimesis, as they're copying nature, copying the world, and bringing it to us, representing it to us. 
But in post-structuralism, there is a different way of looking at things. They say, no, if since language is understood as a language in use, in other words, it's only important what's in use. Language as a, as a, as a, as a thing, like al Arabia or French language or English language, conceived of as a system there, is different from the one I'm using. When I'm using it, it's different. When you're using it, it's different. Because you're a subject, and, you, and subject is subjective, and you're bringing into it not only your subjectivity, but your, I don't know, maybe your limits, but also your complexity, your own feelings, your own personality, your, your own fears, your desires, your frustrations, can be expressed with that thing, too. Right? So it's not neutral. It's not objective. Language in use is not objective. Representation, then, is not objective either. It's not what it says. It's a misnomer. It says something, but it does actually something completely different because of all these things that we bring into it as speakers, as people. We're not just, we're not, uh, when say, you see, speaker is really interesting because when you put your phone on speaker mode and you want to talk, <laughs> it's a speaker, right? The speaker is this, this, this uh, thing from which you can hear the music, for example, on your, uh, at home with, this, with the system, the, the you know, stereo, and you, know, and you have the speakers, like the speakers here. We're saying in Arabic book, which is just one thing. And the same word is used for a person who speaks, too. Say he's a speaker, or she's a speaker. And that also is called a speaker. But that one doesn't have nothing. That one is just a technical thing. Whereas you, no, you're different. You're not a technical thing. You're a person, you're a personality, you have a psychology, you have a psyche, you have your fears, your love, your whatever. All the things, right? We're complex. And so, using language cannot be separated from those things that make us who we are, that make the individual who he is or she is. You know, we speak from our own selves. When you tell a story, you tell, it, you, you tell the story from your own subjectivity. subjectivity. Thank you. Yes. Right? Okay? And so representation becomes problem, becomes problematic, and then the post-structuralist philosophers, they prefer the word discourse. They say, no, it's a discourse. It's not representation, it's a discourse. And so when you hear professors talking about discourse, post-colonial discourse, colonial discourse, 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 all the time, they're always you know, giving you a headache with this word discourse everywhere. <laughs> that's what it means. I don't know if they know it. But anyway, that's where it comes from. Because we're saying that whoever speaks is speaking from a position. The speaker is speaking from a position. We call it a position. Right? So when you talk, you talk, in other words, you're not objective. And you have to be conscious that you're not objective. Right? So that's why they prefer the term dis uh, discourse. And, and, uh, and it's Michel Foucault who used it. The first, I mean, who made it in the, the, uh, the general understanding we have of it today comes from Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault is a French, French philosopher. The concept of discourse translates a view of language as being linked to subjective social processes as opposed to closed or immutable states. In other words, it doesn't talk about things that are immutable and final and non-changing, but it is actually different because it's, it is linked to subjective social processes, cultural processes, ideologies, etc., etc. Right? When it's in use, this is how it is. So we can talk about language and language in use. Language in use is discourse. Because when it's in use, it's you. It speaks you. We say, language speaks us. We don't speak language, it speaks us. It doesn't mean that language speaks. You understand this thing? It's bizarre to say language speaks us. Yeah. But in, what it means is that it reveals who we are. Mm -hmm. Through it, we, we give, we reveal, Intuitive. right? Who we are, right? Our personality, our uh, biases, our preferences. 
our craziness or our brilliance or intelligence, but also our stupidity sometimes too. <laughs> right? So anything comes with, comes out with it too. It's like a it's like water. <laughs> you know, with water it can be clean, but it can also carry all kinds of stuff in it. Okay, so this course means an instance of language or utterance involving the speaker, writer, subject, and reader, listener, object. In other words, you don't speak to no one, you speak to someone. Language is always in use in a context where there is someone who listens and someone who talks, or a conversation, or a discussion, or something like that. So we don't just use it. No, if you see someone talking in the streets, that's a different story. Talking to themselves, <laughs> it's not the same, right? But if, you, but if you, like we're doing here, we're talking uh, and we are uh, involved in a context and, we, and, and, my, and whatever I'm saying here, if I say what I'm saying here outside in the street, people think I'm crazy, right? But if I'm saying it here, you think, oh, no, no, he's just a teacher. <laughs> he's just trying to teach us something, right? So the context decides for what and, and what, what is it that gives me the, the authority to be here to talk and not you standing here. So that, that the context, in other words, it speaks something. Right, so this is the located and in, inflected by its social and ideological environment. The term discourse denotes language in actual use within its social and ideological context and in institutionalized representations of the world called discursive practices, right? What we're doing here is a discursive practice. Coming to the university is a set of discursive practices, a general discursive practice whereby you are learning things and discussing things and, you know, and you've been examined and been you know, expected to, to understand and expected to ask questions, which you don't usually do. <laughs> and also to be, you know, to, at the end, to prove that you have understood <laughs> in an exam. And that decides for your future whether you pass or fail. And that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> this is the tragedy <laughs> of things. It's the absurd thing, but it is what it is. Yes? Uh, I have a question regarding why there's a difference between French representation and English performers. Ah, the words? No, yeah. like what we, in, in theater. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Is it like because they believe in different approaches, or why do they use representations of these different performers? Yeah, it's just, I don't, that's, that's very interesting. Because even now, for French, for example, there is, the word performance doesn't exist. Performance, it, it doesn't sound, it sounds like constructed, it sounds like coming from English. Yeah. Performance, uh, performance is more like in sports, for example. They use it in performance, in sports, it's like achieving something, do whatever you do, right? Participating in a race, and then you talk about your performance in that, how, much, how did you perform well or not well. But in English, it has this. Uh, in French, you would not find it in other things. You will find it only in competitions most of the time, I think. Yeah. In, in, comp in, France, in French, it's in competition, mostly, that we speak about. For, for example, uh, also in... in uh, interesting. Because you use it also for music. Yeah. Yeah. In music, for example, in a concert. If you play a concerto or if you play a sonata or something, they say your performance, how his performance was. But in theater, we don't use that. Which is interesting. They use it now with like the, the contemporary dance forms, etc. Like they call it performance in dance, right? In in uh, in choreography, uh, yeah, because it's more individual, right? Uh, but but in, in English, when you say a performance, we're watching a theater performance. Yeah, from the beginning, people just say it like that, uh, without any kind of thinking. It's just like performance, because it's uh, and. It, 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 it has like this sense of someone trying to do uh, something better uh, on stage, right? The, which gives us the sense of competition, but it's not really a competition because you're just trying to, to bring something different because there is an involvement, there is your there is a subjective involvement in what you're presenting to the public or something like that, yeah. So that's probably why it's a bit complicated. Anyway. So, we talk about discursive practices, and so novel writing is a discursive practice. Poetry is a discursive practice, right? Politics is a discursive practice. All of these are discursive practices. Uh, storytelling, right? Uh, singing is a discursive practice. All of these things, because it, it, it's a practice of discourse. 
a practice where, whereby you, in, you, you let yourself inside. I mean, you, you imprint it with your, it's like you, you stamp it with your personality, you stamp it with your, with, with, with your subjectivity. Right? Do you understand? Yes. Okay, so, let's move on. Uh, so, throughout this course may include any form of utterance, with the central theory, notably through Michel Foucault's work, has stressed the collusion of discourse with power. Right? That's the part which is common when we talk about discourse. This is always this question of power. We talked about this before about the question of power, and the issue of power is really important, and we don't see it most of the time. We don't pay attention to it. We don't even question it sometimes. Most of the time, we don't. For example, the, when, 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 you give a, when you give an account about something, uh, just us as uh, students or as you know, people, ordinary people, uh, you, can give a, you can give an account of something, and that account gives, involves a, a, a certain amount of authority and power in it because you are the one who's saying it. Just by the fact of being the one who says it or writes it gives you an authority. That's why we call an author. Author comes from authority. Who has the authority of what, over what has been said or what is being said is the author because there is a power, authority, involved. When you write a story, you're the author of the story. In other words, you, you, that, in, that instance of writing the story is the one that gives you the authority and the power to write about people or about things. And the authority comes from knowledge, it comes from being appointed to do so, or something like that, right? Being designed or designated for the job of, 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 telling, of making a report or of uh, telling a story or something like that. So there is a question of power. And so from there, we, that, that question of power becomes like widened to and, 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 and generalized over all instances of power. And so there is the, the question that, you know, most of the time we use this in, in the way that, for example, Europeans in the 18th and 19th century, especially 19th century artists and writers, etc., represented the, the other countries, like Africa, like uh, the Middle East, like Morocco, like India, etc. They wrote, the English writers, French writers, wrote about those countries. And they wrote, of the, uh, wrote about them in a certain way that made the perception of people in the West, in Europe, for example, become like normalized over those countries, which we call, you know, stere stereotypical. It creates stereotypes, right? And so, they have created, this is what Edward Said, if you know the Edward Said. Edward Said is a, was a Palestinian-American uh, writer. I mean, he was a professor at Columbia University, but he was, he was a theorist of, uh, of post-colonial studies. He's one of the, you know, the people who started it. And so, for example, he, say, he talks about Orientalism as a movement. There was a movement called Orientalism, actually, in the 19th century in Europe. And that, that's uh, writers and artists who went to the or what they call the Orient, is anything that's not Europe, right? And so they go to the Middle East, they go to different places, and they make either paintings or they make or they write stories, etc. And he was most interested in art, but also in novels. And so the, the Orientalist uh, representations were biased, right? They were biased because they were written by people who are outside of that, but also they were written with a sense of superiority, right? Even if it doesn't say so, but it, the text betrays it. Reading those things, you see that the person who, who talks about them, and then he says, like, they do this. Like in Morocco, the men have like 10 wives in a harem, etc. And so they start about talking about them, not us, right? We don't do that. And so they fantasize it. And so he says, this is a fantasy. It's an imagined world. It's, it's a fantasy. That's what they want. They are interested in magical things, in things that are fantastic, because it's appealing, because people will be interested in them, etc. And so the problem is that this got into politics and started to, because these are people who were influential, and their writings, usually when you write, you write with a, with a sense of, with the purpose of making an influence. You don't write for nothing, 
right? Especially if you're a good writer or someone who has things to say, as those writers and artists of the 19th century went to these countries and they wrote and, re and represented those countries to their country, to their own people. And so they created, created a vision, a general conception of those countries, a general vision of those countries that impacted even decision makers like uh, governments, right? And the governments, you know, made policies based on those, on those visions. Colonialism is one of them, right? When you represent the people as their as savages or as, you know, uh, primitive, then the French or the, the English who think of themselves as civilized, they say, well, we have to civilize these poor people. We have to take civilization to them because they, they don't know anything, right? We have to teach them, we have to teach them hygiene, we have to teach them uh, uh, how to... Uh, huh? I'm sorry? Yeah, but that's, yeah, of course, yeah. But the, when then it became very strong, and then they came to us and they said, well, you're stupid, we have to teach you how to, to behave. Okay? And so that's why the power is interesting in this. And the representation has a, a certain amount of power behind it. And so discourse, and that's why it's called discourse, because representation then becomes discursive, because it's related to a position of power, and that position of power influences the world. Right? It creates new things. It creates a new reality. It creates a divide between them and us. Right? Ben Battuta did that. You know Ben Battuta? Yes. Ah, ben Battuta wrote, but he was, he was in, I think he was not lucky enough because we didn't, he didn't do it in a time of great, uh, let's say, uh, power, economic and military power of Morocco. Otherwise, Morocco would be ruling the world now. <laughs> because what he wrote about the other peoples, and, you know, he went everywhere. And, he, and if you read some of the descriptions of the people he met, I mean, you would be laughing because he says, for example, the people of the, uh, I, talk, is it, uh, I can't exactly remember where he was talking about some people living in such cold weather that he says their brains are frozen and so they can't think. Those people, it's impossible for those people to think because their brains must be frozen in that cold. And so when he says that to Morocco in, I don't know what century was that, he, you know, people would think, wow, people there don't even think. Maybe we should go and teach them how to think. <laughs> but we, it didn't happen because we didn't have the power. The Orientalists, however, they worked in a, in a context of, of, you know, of economic and military power in those countries that allowed those countries to make policies to go and conquer those other countries and colonize them and, and, and actually basically just loot them, take everything they have. Because they say, well, they have gold. We don't, they don't know what to use it for. So let's just take it. Anyway, so that's the idea of discourse as power, or discourse with power. Discourse, he says, articulated categories of thought, or there's knowledge along lines that produce subjects open to power's control. It orders knowledge, look at that. Orders knowledge along lines that produce subjects, right? It orders knowledge, in other words, it, it, it puts knowledge in, in such a way that it, it can produce subjects, in the, for example, the representation of Africans in, in some of the novels, the European novels, or, or people from the Middle East or someplace, they, they produce them. They, they, in other words, they represent them in ways that produces different people than the ones that they actually see. But it's because the imagination, the fantasies of, the, of those writers uh, are at work. And so they produce a distorted vision, distorted image of those countries. And so when you give them, when you give to the, your country, to your you know, the decision makers, that kind of reports about, it's what happened, for example, with Columbus when he went to America, yeah. right? He, he brought even some Indians with him to show to the king of Spain, to say, these are the people who, pop, who, who live there. I mean, they're very simple. They don't think, they have no language. We have to teach them how to talk. They have no religion. They are fearful, they are superstitious, uh, they eat whatever, they're like animals. Huh? They're easy to manipulate. Yes, and so they can, and, and they produced, and that's how that knowledge was ordered, was made up in a certain way, that produced a, a subject, a colonial subject, what we call a colonial subject, who is easy to control. 
And so they went and controlled that place. They did the same in Africa by making, for example, Africans as animals. And so they said, well, these people are big and strong. Let's take them and, and use them for work. And so they created slavery. I mean, they, they did not create it. It was there already. But they used it. They used them as slaves and, sell, and sold them uh, in, in the Americas, in the New World, to work in farms for free. I mean, slave work. So that's what we call producing a subject open to power's control, to be controlled by power. Right? It's a representation. So from a representation, we create something else. Right? We start with the representation of Africans as almost like animals, right? And then you create a whole system whereby the Africans are taken from their land to other countries and used as slaves because they were thought of as beasts, not as humans. So that's how power intervenes. Okay? So the consequences of this have been the post structure greater attention to specific stories, to the details and local contextualizations of concrete instances, in other words, taking those things and really trying to separate them and see that there is a problem, including the question of power in them, and say, well, you saw that because you were in power. I mean, what is it that allowed you to talk that way about these people? unless you had a sense of superiority and you thought that they had like a moral authority over them and a moral power over them. So that's why we're doing this. It's only through post-structuralism that these things became apparent as we started really to look at these things as, uh, as instances of power, as a, you know, as a not true objective, object, uh, objective realities, but actually made up constructed ideologies. Yeah. Uh, I have another example, for mm -hmm. example, the, the Spring Arab. The, the Arab Spring? Uh -huh. Arab, yeah. The, it was launched by just words, by people just rising on a platform, and then uh, these words made people rebellious, and they went without even agreeing, they just went to the streets and right. start the Arab Spring. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a thing too, yeah. Uh, it, it, it came up from like stories shared on Facebook, yeah. And was it Twitter at the time? Did that exist? <laughs> Mostly Facebook. Yeah. Right, people sharing stories about what happened, etc. And then, you know, just like that from one to one. Yeah. You, got, you got a new reality completely different from that. Okay. Uh, greater emphasis on the body, the actual insertion of the human into the texture of time and history, uh, etc. Like these are examples of, uh, of what we pay attention to in, in, in representation as discourse, right? The greater attention to the specifics of cultural working, you know, how culture works. Cultural, we, we say this is cultural, right? And we, this is where the, what we call cultural studies came from. It came from this. It came from, for example, when culture was only thought of as high culture, right? You say taqafa, or in Arabic you say taqafa mutaqaf. is a person who knows things, who knows things that the ordinary people don't know. And who doesn't actually, and, and in, that, in that conception of culture, we think that popular culture is your worthless. It's no good. I mean, taqaf uh, al is garbage, right? That's the end. Say, wait, wait a minute. No. But how, who, whose culture are we talking about here when we say culture is only high things? It's only like big art, classic mu classical music, uh, going to the museums, reading books, talking about subjects, etc., philosophy, art, whatever, discussion. That's bourgeois society. That's bourgeois culture. In other words, it's a class culture. It's a culture of a certain class that wants to spread it over the others. And by doing that, you, as uh, people from the, from the people, the ordinary people, the working class people, will never be able to reach it and will never be able to have access to it because it's not their class, their working class. And so, but they give you the illusion or they're creating you the desire to you want to, to join it, so you want to be able also to appreciate good music and art and cinema and theater and read books and this and this. But you can't, because first you have to have money. <laughs> and, and that's what people do when they have a lot of money and when they have time, because they don't have to cook in their houses, they don't have to clean their houses, they don't have to have a job, like from eight in the morning until six in the you know, in the evening, and come home completely exhausted and want just to sleep, right? That's what the working class does. And so they will never be able to have that culture, yet they, 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 
they convince them that that's the only valid culture, that their culture, that whatever they're interested, the pop culture, the mm, you know popular music, why why whatever. <laughs> they say no no. Even you should think of it as bad. Even the people who produce it are, are, are convinced to think about popular culture as terrible, as not good, as worthless, as like, ugh, uh, whatever, that, the, the bees, uh, what do you call it? And, um, it's like fish, whatever. It's, it's like, ah, it's like no, no, uh, no standards, no culture, no status. So they, they convince people that their culture is zero, is nothing, right? And the only culture that's valid is that one. And you only do that to control people. And so they will never be able to value their own culture. Now, cultural studies, the people who did cultural studies were very alert to this. They say, well, that can work in one country, but then it also works worldwide. You know, it works at the level of one country. For example, in Morocco, there are a lot of people, if you, if you listen to, I, I remember when we used to listen to Rai or to Najat Atabu or something. You even know these people? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and then, and, and someone like a teacher, I mean a teacher, his father was like a worker in some field. He's a working class person. And he says, How, why do you listen to that, that garbage? What should I listen to? Well, you have to listen to Um Kultum. You have to listen to Abdul Wahab. You have to listen to, I don't know, Farid Atrash. Those are not even Moroccan, <laughs> right? But that, they convinced that that's the only valid culture. And so you have to forget your own culture. You have to just you know, throw it away. That works at this level, but it also works at, at, the, at, the world, at the worldwide level when, for example, the only valid culture is the Western culture and the rest is just garbage. I mean, just like, well, Okay. Curiosities, we would call it. And if there is something valuable, something nice in it for the Western, they would say, oh, it's a curiosity. Wow, that's interesting. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's exotic. It's nice. It's exotic. But it's not us. We can only go there and enjoy it and come home. But it's not us. We don't practice that. Right? And so there is like a, a hierarchy of cultures that is created and that convinces people of its validity. And it convinces the people who are down there that it's valid, that the hierarchy is okay, it's legitimate, it's fine to think in this way. And people will never rise up and say, no, that's not true. Why is my culture considered garbage while yours is considered more interesting? So that's the question of power. And people don't pay attention to that. In, cult in, in cultural studies, the people who study this say, no, that's bourgeois culture. And you're only using it because it serves your <laughs> purposes. But it's not our culture. And so we have to, to value the culture of the people. Popular culture became interesting. <coughs> people have started, and, and now it's, there is the, it's not exactly the same anymore, only for some, in some places where people are stupid. But most of the time, popular culture has become culture. Culture is culture. It's not, there is not such a thing as popular and high culture. Popular culture has, become, has risen up to the level of culture too. And people value it, and people study it, and people talk about it, and find it interesting. And we don't have to be ashamed, you know, feeling ashamed, you know, by dealing with it or talking about it. Right? That's why, for example, you are interested in subjects in your research papers for the sixth semester, in 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 things that are part of the culture, talking about the way marriages are done in this country and, and this part and this, or any other social or cultural phenomena that you think about. And so it's valuable now because of this breaking down those dichotomies, right? Post-structuralism broke those dichotomies, allowed us to break them down and say, and understand them for what they are. They are instances of power. They have power relations embedded into them and we don't pay attention to them most of the time. We only pay attention to them when we use these concepts, when we think about representation, not as imitation, as true imitation of things, but as instance of language in use as discourse. In other words, as something related to power, right? To authority. Yes? Uh, I think uh, in relation to power and uh, classifying the bourgeois culture, it's related to imperialism and capitalism as well. Mm -hmm. Because imperialism and capitalism creates the, this culture of bourgeois so they can <coughs> people to work hard for capitalism to reach to them. So they just have this illusion of uh, the bourgeois culture. 
Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. The cul that culture, the bourgeois culture, is something that makes the lower classes once desire to be part of it, right? right? And, and that's, you know, what, what changed things is that um, what made things completely different today uh, is uh, it's the, the media, I would say, but especially with social media and everything. It, it, it even helped, but, uh, you know, to, to raise things up. Yeah. And so, the, you know, the culture is everywhere now. I mean, you open YouTube, you open Instagram, and you have all kinds of things. And that's culture, too. That is part of culture, except that we have to be very careful when we're talking about digital platforms, those things, and social media platforms. Social media platforms are, are problematic in the sense that they are related to profit making. Right? They're not interested in anything else except YouTube makes money and it's about money. Right? Yeah. And so if you fall into the trap of following all the time what they're saying on YouTube or Facebook or any one of those, you are, you know, if you, you follow someone's, uh, um, and people are using them to become rich too, right? You have, if you have your channel, you can, if, and if you have a lot of followers and people who are viewing your stuff, you can have a lot of money. You know, they, they, it's monetized, so you get money. From it. But m m what Google gets is more than what you get, that, that, what it gives. So it becomes really. So, but it, that, that's where the danger is. But that is a different story. We have to talk about that in a different uh, class, maybe. Okay? And how the, the fact that it is related to these huge uh, capitalist firms like uh, Meta, for example, right? You know, Meta. Meta is the one that owns Facebook and lots of other things. But also, uh, what is the album? Alphabet? It's called Alphabet. It's the one that owns Google. Uh, Google is part of Alphabet. Alphabet is, the, is the, like the mother thing, the mother society, com company. <coughs> but these are huge companies. But then, you know, the profits are um, uh, incredible, etc. And so then it becomes problematic. I have to be careful not to fall in the trap because they only want to use you to make more money. Anyway, so. Uh, Great attention also to the role of language and textuality in our construction of reality and identity. In other words, language intervenes in everything we do, including our own identity. Right? Talking about yourself and understanding yourself too. Or having a concept of who you are. For example, if you say, if somebody asks you, who are you, then what do you say? What is your identity? It's not just your name and date of birth and your address, but it's more than that. Right? And, and anything, and when you think about it, when you say, for example, I am an Arab, or I am an Amazi, or I am something, you are constructing an identity for yourself based on something that is given, based on something that's there, right? You add, you, it's like you join something. You join a discourse. You join a political thing. You join a cultural thing that's already there for you. You're joining it, right? It's not like it's in your body. No, it's, just, it's something that you, you choose to go with, an ideology, a version of things, uh, a culture, a language, etc. Okay? Um, the, relationship, the relationship of literature, uh, it's actually in a discourse. To reality is problematic and complex. Literature represents and refracts reality, and language itself continues, constitutes reality. It's just a formulation of what I've been saying until now. Language precedes the speaking, writing subject, who produces discourse, spoken language. <laughs> by drawing on and arranging the discourses or codes always already, you say this always and already there, available to him or her. In other words, that's what I said, when you join something, when, you bo when you're born, you are born into a language, you're born into a culture and into a language. You do not create the language, but you are born into it. And if you go to school, you are joining the discourse of a nation, for example. Right? We are Moroccans and we have the history of our country and culture of our country politics of our country, and so we join it. It's there for us. We did not create it. We are part of it. So we just join. Uh, it's like, a, no, it's there. It's before us. It's been there, and we just join it. Okay? So whenever you, whatever you do, whatever you write, for example, if you write short, if you like to write short stories, it's, you're basing, uh, you, you write from an experience of short stories, reading short stories. You read, you read short stories and you liked them, and you liked some of them at least, and you s decide, well, I want to write short stories too. 
And you are using styles and, and forms and stuff that exists before that. Even the form of itself, you know, the form, short story itself is a, is a genre that exists. And if you choose into writing that genre, you are joining something that's there before you, that precedes you, right? With its norms and its conventions. And so you have to write. Novels is the same. Poetry is the same, right? Music is the same, whatever you do. You join something that precedes you with its conventions, its norms, and its you know, it's, uh, it's principles and whatever. You have to follow a certain set of conventions to do that so that you can be part of that thing. So it's, it's there before you. Now, the other concept that we use is narrative, right? And this is, you know, we start now to talk less about discourse than about narrative, right? Uh, Two years ago, we proposed a master's program. It's called Narratives. <laughs> narrative, about narrative. But it was not accepted. <laughs> it, it did not actually go through anything because of COVID. So they stopped. They just they said, well, we, the commission that, uh, you know, that talks about, that, that decides, was not meeting. So it didn't work. But it, it's called. We changed it. Anyway. So narrative is, is fundamental, too because it's all narrative. At the end of it, even the discourse is a narrative. And narrative, when you talk about narrative, it's not just language that you put there, but it's actually connections. Because narrative works on connections. You connect things. You connect, you know, you say, I, I was late because the bus uh, didn't come on time, or because I missed the bus, right? It's not just a statement. If you don't say, well, I am late, right? And if you say, I am late because I missed the bus. When you said, because I missed the bus, you created a link between one statement and another statement. And you created cause and effects, right? I am late. The cause is the bus being late. The effect is that you. You missed the bus is the cause. And the, uh, and the, the effect or the result is that you are late, right? That's the narrative. And that's an example of a narrative because it's based on connections and finding logical, causal, connections between things, between one statement and another, between sentences of your essay or whatever it is you're talking about, or your story. Stories are everywhere, in movies, in sitcoms, in cartoons, in commercials, poems, newspapers, articles, novels. Everywhere you have stories. Computer games and websites. We all make story, use of stories every day, and our lives are shaped by stories, stories about what, you, what happened in our dreams or on the bus to school or anything, right? So, you know, basically, stories are everywhere, and stories are narratives. Okay, stories are everywhere, as we say. Not only do we tell stories, but stories tell us. <laughs> stories tell us, right? When you tell a story, it's not just about what you said, but the way you said it and what you put in it can tell us something about yourself, right? You know, you pay attention to someone telling a story and the way they say it, for example, if they're enthusiastic, it says something about your personality. If you're completely indifferent and apathetic, it says something about your personality as well. So it tells you, you know, this is what it means to tell stories. Tell us means story reveal things about us. We tell a story, and that story, even if it's not about us, even if it has something completely different, the, f the choice itself of the story, the fact that you chose to talk about the story, a certain one and not another one, is also important. Why did you choose that one, right? And the way you told it, and to whom you told it, and etc. Et and so those things give hints about who you are as well. That's, why, that's what it means, story tell us, stories tell us. It's like language speakers, like I said earlier. Been spoken by another. Right. Stories are everywhere. We are also in story center. The telling of a story is always bound up with power, with questions of authority, property, and domination. It's same, similar to what I've been talking about earlier. Stories are multiple. There is always more than one story for the same thing. There is more story. I gave you an example of an accident, and you have three people who witnessed it. You have three stories about the same event, right? Or you go watch a movie, right? You watch a film at the same time, and then you talk about it differently, or you write about it, you will have three different stories about it. The film itself will be understood differently between, among you. You will have different stories. Stories always have something to tell us about stories themselves, right? 
they always involve self-reflexive and metafictional dimensions. In other words, how they are also made. Stories tell us about also how they are made. That's what we call the metafictional dimension of a story. It's like meta, meta is something above something else. Like uh, a, a metafiction is a fiction about fiction, or like a story about fiction. How to write stories. There are lots of. There is a complete genre of fiction that's called metafiction, where writers do uh, a kind of self-reflection of the story in its own making. In, the, in other words, the way, for example, the, the, there, is, uh, there are lots of examples of these um, where the novelist, for example, talks about characters and starts talking about how you create a character. Instead of just talking about a person with a name, he starts talking about the character and, and, and starts like a critic using you know, the importance of, you know, they get a discourse, a digression, a sort of a discourse inside the story about the writing of a story, right? For example, there is a book by, there's a, uh, where's my pen? It's a novel, but it's a strange novel, it's called Letters, by uh, an American writer called John Barth. He has this novel called Letters. And the book is about letters exchanged between himself and his characters. His characters wrote letters to him. <laughs> it's very strange. No, it's a novel, it's a big novel. Right. And then the characters writing a story, yeah. And, and some of them accusing him of doing bad to them. Says, so why did you write to me about, why did you talk to me? About, Talk about me like this. It was a movie, actually. Oh, there is a split. I know that one, yeah. But that's like a split personality. Yeah. Right. No, this is different. This is like, I don't know how many, how many characters are in the story, but those characters are writing, writing letters. And some of them write letters to the editor. And some writing to the publisher to complain about the author. It's like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one character decided to write to them not to kill them. Yeah. And there was a movement really good. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing where, where you know, you invent different forms. That's why stories are sometimes also about how stories are written, too. Right? Okay. Okay. So disagreements, arguments, even wars are often the result of conflicting stories. Right? Yeah. Right? It's, there is a war, for example, today about between Russia and Ukraine, and it's a confl it's, it's conflict of stories. The Korean Ukrainians have their stories, the Russians have their stories, and it's about that disagreement. Unfortunately, it came to <laughs> to uh, you know gave us a war. Like it's a disagreement that ended up in something bad. Right? Uh, rights of uh, claim claims for land, for example. There is a book called Meta History uh, by a Canadian historian named Hayden White. And, and he says, uh, and actually he has given special emphasis to the fact that history is written in the form of certain kinds of narrative. He called it actually, he says, that when you look at how history is written, he, he did a study, he's a historian. And so he, write, he's, um, he wrote this book, it's called Meta History. And in that book he was talking about, uh, he gave examples of how history writing, historiography, as it's called, uses the same techniques as novel writing, as fiction writing. Right? They write history in the form of stories. And they talk about characters, but about real historical people as if they are talking about, like, 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 like writers, like novelists, talk about characters talking about their psychology, their relationship with their lives, etc. So they imagine so much. In other words, what he says is that even writing history, there's a lot of imagination. Right? And the imagination and the techniques and the metaphors and all the things that we use in writing fiction, in writing novels, are also found in writing history. That's why there is a whole genre called historical fiction, which is based, on it, you know, it's, uh, last year we had one who does that. Last year, the, an author, a Moroccan writer uh, who came here. Yeah. I don't know if you met him. Some of you were there in April last year. 
and he wrote story, uh, he writes novels about historical figures, Moroccan historical figures, and he writes their story from a fictional perspective, but he does research before writing. He goes to libraries, he finds lots of books about them, he reads uh, lots of history books, and then it takes him like three, five years sometimes to be able to write a novel about a historical figure. For example, he wrote a novel about, uh, um, uh, what's his name, about one of the Mo uh, Moroccan ambassadors to France, his, his name is Ben Aisha, I don't know if you know him, it's uh, at the time of Moulay uh, in, in the 17, in the 18th century, who went to France, and, and he's, you know, he writes, he writes about his life in Paris, and his friends, and what he did, etc. But it's all, he imagines a lot of things, but based on historical documents, and so he writes that too. In other words, metafiction, uh, metahistory uses, I mean, history uses the same thing, same process, uh, processes, same uh, techniques as writing novels. Okay, the, the task of the historian is to charge, he says, the task of the historian is to charge events with a comprehensible plot structure, right? They're also interested in a plot, you know, you know because the basic thing in a novel or in a story is the plot, right? You have to have like, what happens. It's a relationship between people that gives a complication or something. He also finds that in, historical, in historiographic uh, documents as well. Science is composed of stories too. Right? We think of science as something that's completely there, it's like uh, formulas and all. No, it's actually not. Physics is all about behavior of atoms. And the behavior of atoms can be described only in terms of language. And so you can describe them only using language, and so there are stories too. Astronomy attempts to narrate the beginnings of the universe. You, you, you listen, go to, I don't know, the uh, National Geographic or, you know, TV, the channels, or if you, on your phones or computers. And you can watch, for example, the history of the universe, a scientific, a scientific history of the universe. It's told exactly the same thing as a story that you can read about anything. Right? It's the only way to make it known is by telling it as a story. Otherwise, if you just keep it as like a data, it's useless. Right? It's the storytelling that matters, not the data. The data is important, but then if it's not turned into a story, then it stays as just like pieces of information that are m used only by specialists for, yes. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so um, geology seeks to tell the story of the formation of mountains, etc., plains, rivers, same thing, the geology. So we can give as many examples as you can, as you find about how things, how science also is based on, on stories. <clears throat> okay, then the simplest way of, this, of, of uh, defining a story or a narrative is a series of events in a specific order. I mean, it doesn't say chronological, it says specific order. Because that specific order is vague. When you say specific, it's vague. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's supposed to be clear, but it's not. <laughs> huh? Because if you say in chronological order, you have decided that only stories that are chronologically ordered are stories, the rest is not. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have stories that are not chronological at all, that they actually go against chronology, so the opposite, right? So a specific order with a beginning, a middle, and an end. This is the general assumption about stories. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? That's the narrative. Example, Joyce, James Joyce, I don't know, I use examples from all the time. James Joyce short story, The Dead. This is a short story called The Dead by James Joyce. And it's about Dublin, you know, the, you know, it comes from the book called Dubliners. Dublin is the capital of Ireland. And, and he, and Joyce speaks about Ireland in his books all the time. And this, everything is about Ireland. And this one, it's called The Dead. Um, yeah, the, when the story begins with, I mean, you can simplify it and say, for you know, if you go with the narrative, with the events, with chronology, nothing really happens. Because it's only, then you have the arrival of Gloria and his wife Greta at a party. And then the story tells us of the events of the party and then how the couple walk home and at the end they fell asleep in their hotel room. But it's, when you think of this, what you would say, oh, well, this story is about like two pages, three pages? No, it's more than that. It's at least 20 pages long, 
It's like about 20 pages long. It's a really long story. It's a short, it's a long, short story. And, and, it's, and, and what happens inside is much more than just this, right? But it does have that structure of beginning, and beginning middle, and end, right? Okay. <clears throat> this description of the story is based on the temporal order, or chronological, you know, following the chronology. If you follow it, that's why you say, well, there's a beginning, this is how it began, this is the middle, and this is the end. That's an order of time, the following the order of time. Well, maybe it began, they left, uh, say, in the morning, and they came back at night. So if, uh, from morning to midday to night, so it, you have a chronological order there. Right. Or, okay. But that are, narratives are not, and stories are not always just chronologically ordered. Right. You'll see that there is a lot more. The, they also invariably involve what the narrator, narratologist, Jean Genet is a French narratologist of the 1970s and 80s. And I already mentioned it in one of his books called Seuil, when we started the beginnings in the first, first few sessions when we talked about beginnings of fiction, beginnings of novels and poems, etc. I talked about in Seuil, the thresholds of the books, the titles, the epigrams, the things that start the book. But he has another one. Uh, a book that has actually a sort of a, a form of analysis of narrative techniques, if you want, right? It's called narratology, right? So he, he says that the stories um, involve anachronism, right? You know what's an anachronism? Yeah. Okay. Anachronism. It's when time is this, like a completely this, the, the, it's like a, it's about uh, chronic, you know, we say chron, chron because it's time. Anachronism is when, when you bring something from the past in the future or you take something from the future into the past, right? And put it there. And so you, you create an, an imbalance in time. Right? Anachronism, for example, would be <laughs> like, huh? Out of this world could be that, but there is also an anachronism in, in films most of the time, for example, like, no, it's, it's like the time travel, right, going to the future or going to the past from the present, or a, a character or a historical person from the past is brought into the future, uh, into the present time, today, right, whereas that person is actually dead centuries ago, and you bring him now here and make him, you know, walk in the streets of Bushda. So that's an anachronism, right? It's in fiction, so it's very common in fiction. It's, it's not just in science fiction, but in fiction in general. Um, that's an anachronism. Um, flashbacks, jumps forwards, what you call the prolapse. And the analepsis is like, we're going back with the flashback. Is, the technical word for flashback is analepsis, analepsis, and uh, for a moving forward, like fast forward to the future, is called prolepsis, prolepsis, like going forward. That's what you have there, prolepsis, because it's future, as a plural, what is that? Yeah, the question. Right. Uh, there. The, the, it can be slowing down uh, and speeding up of events and other distortions of the linear time sequence. You know, there are so many ways of breaking the time sequence Chronology is here also uh, problematized in the sense that it is not the order of things, not the natural order of things, because chronology is what we see outside of us. It's some, it, it looks like, because we, we use time, right? We have, we have watches, we have phones that tell you time, and so you wake up in the morning, you do this, and it's an evening, and then etc. And think of, you think of yesterday as past and today, and then you think of tomorrow as future, etc. Why are we living only in the moment? Right? Physically and materially, we live only now, right? But anything that went before us only, is only memory. And anything that's coming is only an anticipation. So, but uh, normally we are living here. And the time, the time, the minutes, the seconds, etc., are made only for practical you know, purposes so that we can. We can divide our time, we can uh, organize our lives, we can go to work, etc., go to school, do this, etc., economy. It's based on this time thing that we call the watch, right? Bring, break in the time, the hours into minutes, and the day into hours, and the week into days, and 
months into weeks and the year, etc., and centuries, etc. And so we're breaking time like that to manage it because it becomes more manageable. We, have, we can talk about it, we can use it. But it's all artificial, it's not real. Time there is only a continuum of time, right? We're living here now, and it's a constant present that we're living, right? And I think that's when, so you can't go back in the future, in the past, for example. You know, science fiction that goes, I want to go back into, you know, like time machine to go back and you find yourself there. It's not like you're leaving pieces of yourself as you go. Or like versions of yourself in the past, you leave them there physically so you can go back to them in a time. You can't do that. Science fiction is only this. It says, we can imagine it. It's imagination. And so we are constantly just living a present moment all the time. And so we can break that, right? Imagination, you know, literature allows you to do that, art allows you to do this, to break that, you know, be imprisoned in the moment. So we can think about the future, we can think about the past, etc. And so, um, so the breaking up of time is what makes, you know, a novel or a fiction or any text, uh, what makes it sometimes worthwhile to read. For example, those of you who read the out of this world, you know, in last year, in extensive reading, we had this book with a novel called Out of This World, and this novel is divided into chapters, and those chapters have no chronology, right? If you're looking for them, I mean, it starts somewhere in the middle. And then even the story itself is told in such a way that you have to read all of it to understand the whole story, otherwise you will not be able to, because it doesn't follow the order, the chronological order. It's like the author himself says that he takes his book, he writes them, and then he shuffles the chapters. It's like he shuffles cards. Like playing cards, he shuffles them, and then he puts them this. Okay, <laughs> they have no numbers, nothing. There is not that chapter one, two, three, four. No, yeah. there is no order. Professor, I remember you told us that this is how our mind naturally. And that's how memory works too, because if you try to remember, if you, now if you try to remember your childhood, for example, where would you start? In the middle. You can't start in the beginning. You don't even know where the beginning is, yeah. right? And, and then you would have flashes, and you wouldn't know whether it was this when I was one year old, or this was a seven, when was it five, when was three, when was seven, ten, twelve, etc. And so you have like pieces, you have like flashes of memory from different periods, and it's hard to even put them in order. That's how memory works. Memory is very... And so narrative tries to copy the way narrative, the memory works, right? Because the, everything, our lives are only memory. Like I said, we live the moment, and our life is behind us. Yeah. And we also believe that our life is in front of us too, because there is still more time to go, right? We believe, we hope that we have more years to live, and so we, we want to imagine ourselves being in somewhere else, different things, etc. And so, the, the, but the memory, that uh, this can be done in fiction, because it allows us to break that order of things and so on. Okay? So, Ian Foster, for example, so time is crucial to narrative, not only as chronology, but also as broken up as completely reshuffled and, 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 and disordered in that sense. So Ian Fuster is an English novelist, uh, and, uh, it's like 20th century, a very famous no novelist, E.M. Fuster. I don't know if you know him, right? I don't know if some of his famous novels that we used to have in class when I was a student, right? And he has a book, he's, a, he's also a critic, he wrote about, about novels, and it's called The Aspect, Aspects of the Novel. It's a famous, this is a famous book, by the way. And it says, uh, it's an old one, it's 1927. The chronological order of events is not the whole story. Right? It says, Forster makes a distinction between, look at this one, this is really interesting. It said, the king died and then the queen died. He gives this example. It says, because he was talking about narrative. It says, the queen, the king died, died and then the queen died. That's one thing. And he says, well, that's different from saying, the king died, and then the queen died of grief. Right? What's the difference? He added of grief because of grief, right? Died of grief. The reason why. Yeah, because he inserted causality in there. In other words, he insulted the he, ins he ins inserted. That's the word. He inserted a relationship between parts of that sentence, the two sentences. He made one the cause of the other, causality, right? Cause and effect. And so narrative works this way. That one here, the king died and then the queen died, is not narrative. It's because it's the same time, it's like it's instantaneous or something happened after one another 
but only, but no cause. We don't know how. We don't know why the queen died too at the same time. Why did, okay? So that's what you call, uh, it's 12. So I think we have to stop here. And we can continue this next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.